In this particular session, we want to discuss the law of Zion. Now, we've talked about the atonement in its dual role in relation to Gethsemane and the forgiveness of sins and in relation to Calvary and the payment of Adam's sin or transgression, transgression more appropriately. And we've talked about becoming sons and daughters of Christ, and we've talked about the, the new life that's in Christ as revealed in the Book of Mormon, and we've talked about the doctrines of justification and sanctification and enduring to the end and, and all that kind of thing. Now, today we're dealing with more some of the more sophisticated doctrines. Uh, the holy order is one of these. And uh, the law of Zion uh, is another. And we need then to, to see things now on the foundation of what we've discussed, but view things now in relation to the more elaborate or sophisticated program of the, of the kingdom. Now, it's necessary to build Zion in order to prepare for the second coming of Christ. A lot of people want to see the Lord coming, and they wonder how long the corruption is going to go on. But let me tell you this, the Lord will never come until we're living the law of consecration. He will never come until, now he might make an appearance to his prophet and that kind of thing, and that is being done uh, from time to time according to his will, but he will never come in the sense of dwelling and being with his people until we have built Zion. He will never come uh, to fulfill the great events of the latter days until Zion has been established. See? Now, here, for example, in section 105 of the Doctrine and Covenants, this is the great revelation in which the Lord, as it were, canceled out the law of consecration in the original effort of the saints to, to teach and apply it. And uh, uh, is given uh, uh, if what we call Fishing River in Missouri, given when the prophet had taken Zion's camp from Kirtland, that thousand-mile march, on down through to Missouri, with the intent, hopefully, of reestablishing uh, the saints on their inheritances in Jackson County. And when he got down there, Governor Dunklin of the state of Missouri backed off and got cold feet and said, I can't support you in your effort. Now, he had said that he would prior to that. But without then the support from that angle then, Zion's camp was disbanded, and uh, uh, the Lord gave a revelation there in Missouri and the fishing river, and this is what he said. Verse 1, Verily I say unto you, who have assembled yourselves together, that you may learn my will concerning the redemption of my afflicted people. Behold, I say unto you, were it not for the transgressions of my people, speaking concerning the church, and not individuals, they might have been redeemed even now. Now, that's way back in 1834. He says, But behold, they have not learned to be obedient to the things which I required at their hands, but are full of all manner of evil, and do not impart of their substance as becometh saints to the poor and the afflicted among them, and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. And that union is a spiritual union in Christ and under the holy priesthood, and also an economic union in and by and through the law of consecration. And that's not collectivism, by the way. It's sanctified or Christian free enterprise with a union that's ideal and individualism with stewards rather than collective machinery. Now he goes and he says, and are not united according to the union required by the celestial kingdom, and note this in verse 5 now, and Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom, otherwise I cannot receive her unto myself. Now we'll never be fully received to the Lord until we live that program. And that principle applies in many different ways. Christ will not come and receive his people unto himself on earth until we have uh, uh, 
applied the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. You will never become an heir of God and a joint heir through Christ in eternity unless it's on the same basis. If you haven't learned the principle of consecration and to apply it, you cannot be exalted. I don't care how many times you've been married in the temple or how many times you've been through or how many times you've been baptized. You cannot attain those things unless you come up to that standard. And in that sense, then, they're absolutely necessary. Uh, here's, for example, how President George Q. Cannon explained it. He was a, kind of a J. Reuben Clark in his day. He was a counselor in the first presidency to, to more than one president, and he was not only a great mind theologically, one of the great of this dispensation, but he was also a prominent political figure among the saints. Uh, a man of great understanding who knew the prophet personally and who had an avid love for him and uh, uh, understood his doctrines and his teachings and the whole concept of Zion. One of the really mature minds of this dispensation, George Q. Cannon. He says this, As a people we are expecting the day to come when Jesus will descend in the clouds of heaven. But before this day, we must be prepared to receive him. The organization of society that exists in the heavens must exist on the earth. The same condition of society, so far as applicable to mortal beings, must exist here. And for this purpose, God has revealed this order that we call Zion. You see that? Now, we've got to build it up. Uh, in the inspired revision of the Bible, you have there in Genesis chapter 9 a sacred covenant which the Lord made initially with Enoch and then renewed through Noah, pertaining to Noah's posterity in the latter day. And in this covenant he uses uh, the symbol of the rainbow. Uh, the rainbow arching from here clear on over. Above the rainbow, the presence of God. Below the rainbow, the canopy of it, people in mortality. And he takes that simile uh, and that uh, idea and ties it in and relates it to this sacred covenant which he made initially with Enoch and then renewed with, uh, with Noah. And he explains then the nature of it and says this, The bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Enoch, speaking now to Noah. And here's the gist of it, that when man should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth. The city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself, and this, he says, is my everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity, talking to Noah, and his posterity is under the canopy of the rainbow, when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, get our feet off the ground, I mean our eyes off the ground, and look upward because the flow of the Spirit is here. And we're not just looking to theology, we're looking to the Lord and to the flow of the Spirit. We're looking upward then. He says, uh, Then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. That's at the return of the city of Enoch. And the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Now that's this holy order and its perfected program, or at least among Enoch and his people and other uh, who have been on this earth and who will come with Christ in the second coming. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth and shall have place until the end shall come. All right, now, what does that say about the second coming? What's involved in the second coming? When the angel Moroni appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith in 1823, he made it very, very clear that the time had come to preach the gospel of the kingdom as a means of preparing people for the second coming of the Lord. Now, how do you prepare them? Well, you start by getting them into the church. 
And then the church is here as, uh, as a construction crew. It's here to work. It's a work crew. Uh, we had a temple built in Provo. It was, uh, it was farmed out to a construction crew, one of the best. They built it. They designed it. They built it. They put the capstone on. They put the carpets in. And then when they got through, what did they do? They had completed their job. So they left. And if they had nothing else to do, they would be disorganized, and that would be it. And then they could come back into the temple and get the blessings of it, see. Now, the church is a construction crew. It's here for the perfecting of the saints. And what's it building? It's bringing people to Christ. And then it's building the sacred order of Christ, i.e., the Zion society of which he is king. He is king of Zion. He's the father, then, of the faithful in the Zion order under the man of holiness and in union with him. And when that order, then, is built up and we apply its principles in our lives, and this construction crew has done its work of teaching, counseling, and at times using the four before, the side of our heads, to get our attention, and at times disciplinary courts, and that kind of thing. When that's done, and then we get into the thing and get it perfected, then what happens to the church? Doesn't have anything more to do. So what happens? It's dissolved. And the good brethren there, meantime, should have been to the temple and married for eternity and got the blessings of the house of the Lord and begin to consecrate. And this eternal order is the house of the Lord program. And that's Zion, see. Right, now, what is the law of Zion? What is the law of Zion? Well, let me suggest to you that there's two divisions to the law of Zion, basic divisions, and then and this is just a manner of speaking. Uh, let's say that Zion then is, and we'll say this is the holy order, and uh, by this we mean then this is the family of Jesus Christ, the born-again family, of which he then is the begetting father, okay? It's the born-again family. Now, in this family, there uh, are sons and daughters, sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Now, how do they become sons and daughters? How do they become sons and daughters? By the articles of adoption, right? They're born again to see the kingdom, like we talked the other day, and then they're born, they can see it, and then they're born of water and the Spirit to enter it, and in that rebirth process, they take upon themselves the name of Christ, and he becomes their father, and they're a part of his family. All right, now, when a person then embraces the gospel, in a manner of speaking, they join two organizations. Now, don't take this too far, because... They're not really two. They become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, and they're confirmed members of his church. How can you get the idea? I say it that way to get the idea, see. Uh, now, they're members of his church, and they're confirmed therein as members. And in that sense, then, uh, they're his sons and daughters, and the church is here now to take those kids and baby tend them. Some of them or that level. And I, I've had a lot of experience around, and some of us get a little bit trite, and we need to repent. We're just a little bit that way. What I'm saying is that the church is here, then, as a nurturing program. It's here to edify. It's, and it's also here to teach the gospel to the world. It's the organized mechanism through which you finally get the gospel taught. It's also the organized mechanism by which you build temples, you see. And so the church, then, is in the posture of construction. And if we want any rewards in the holy order, we need to get in and get the Spirit in the church and operate in the church. There just is no such thing as anything separate from it. The keys of the kingdom today are centered in the living prophet who holds the keys of both, and they're so intertwined and related that you can't separate them. And if you want the blessings of the house of the Lord, we better serve in the church. See, it's that kind of thing. All right, now, so there's a son or daughter level. Now, sons and daughters don't say sons and daughters. They grow up. 
they grow up. Physically, they get their feet under the table for three square meals a day and a few snacks on the side, and finally they, they get their pockets up to where they're stationary. Now, note I don't use the women as a symbol, because I don't know where their skates or skirts ever stay. But they get their pockets up where they're stationary, which implies some kind of maturity physically, see? And then they sidle around and look at each other and eyeball each other from a distance and then a little bit closer, and then they finally get courageous. And uh, uh, he says, wilt thou? And she wilts, you know, and, and that's the way things go. And then they, then they finally, you know, get married or commit matrimony and so forth, and then they start their own family. And then these sons and daughters become fathers and mothers. Isn't that right? And that's the story then of life. All right, so you've raised from fathers and mothers then to, uh, to sons and daughters to fathers and mothers. Now, you become sons and daughters, and I think we've said this before, but let me just emphasize it, through the articles of adoption. And what are the articles of adoption? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, by which you're adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. Now, how do you become fathers and mothers spiritually? What's the process? What's the way? What's the program? What are the ordinances? by which we become fathers and mothers spiritually. Well, this pertains to the house of the Lord. This centers in the house of the Lord. And the central idea of that is that it's, it's the order of things by which we are introduced into that program that centers in the Ancient of Days, or in Adam. And that Abraham, more immediately to us, uh, has a great relationship to and is the father over under Christ for his generation on down through. So when the Lord talks to Abraham here in chapter 2 of Abraham, he's talking to him now about families in this sense. So he says, And I will bless them through thy name, for as many as receive this gospel shall be called by thy name and shall be accounted thy seed and shall rise up and bless thee as their father. So Abraham becomes the father of the born-again people, or those who have gone through rebirth. You see that? Now, when you go to the temple and have the sacred blessings of eternal marriage conferred upon you, among which are the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then you come out of the temple of junior Abraham, brethren, and you sisters, you come out of the temple of junior Sarah. Isn't that right? Now, Abraham had the responsibility of being a father two ways instead of one. He had the responsibility of, of being a father physically. Through him the house of Israel came, and also others, through Ishmael and Keturah and so forth, see. But uh, also through uh, him then the gospel descends, and those who receive the gospel become his sons and daughters under Christ in the holy order. Is that clear? And hence, then, Abraham is called the father of the faithful. That's what that means. All right, now, if I'm an Abraham, what does that say about my obligation to hold family home evening? You got the connection? What is the connection? I'm a father spiritually. What should I then do to my children? I better teach them. I'm the one that ought to bring them through the knowledge and the processes in faith of spiritual renewal and spiritual birth to become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. You see that? And then in the holy order, they're sealed to me under Christ. But this idea merely of a physical family or nuclear family, uh, that's not the idea. The eternal family is the family in Christ. That's the eternal family. It's the family in Christ. And I've got a responsibility to be a father to my children. Who should ordain my kids? I should ordain them if I'm worthy. And uh, who should be consulted when my kids are called to priesthood offices and ward offices? I should be. Now, that's the order of the church, you see. And the correlation program is designed to correlate and do that with a central objective of putting emphasis on the individual and the family. See, that's the idea of the church, and that's where things are going. Now, the prophet Joseph Smith once talked about the order of building this kingdom. I want to turn to page 340. It's one of the classic statements in this dispensation. Here in the teachings, page 340, he's talking now about building this order, which is the order of Zion. 
And he says this, the spirit of Elias is first, Elijah second, Messiah last. Now that's the order of the building. He says, Elias is a forerunner to prepare the way. Now what's the spirit of Elias? <coughs> Spirit of Elias is that spirit associated with the preparatory gospel. Has it got anything to do with family? Has it got anything to do with turning the hearts of the fathers to the children? And the answer is yes. For example, turn over to Luke chapter 1 with me. Now here you have the coming of, of uh, uh, Gabriel, who is Noah, who is the great patriarchal father in the holy order this side uh, of the flood. And uh, Gabriel is coming now to begin the work of the meridian of time, the dispensation, the meridian of time. And he makes an appearance and gives a few instructions concerning the birth now, the anticipated or coming birth of this person, John the Baptist. And he says this, uh, verse 16 of chapter 1, Many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him, before God or Christ, in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now what's Elias, what's John the Baptist going to do? He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All right, now the spirit of Elias is concerned with family. And it isn't just the nuclear family, it's the family in Christ. Okay? All right, now let's put it this way. The spirit of Elias is out here. It's centered in the missionary work and particularly in what we call the preparatory gospel. Uh, and that's the idea of preparing people for the greater revelation of God. And the spirit of Elias then of this holy order, which is the family of Christ, reaches out here, finds some poor wandering Israelite or some humble Gentile, teaches him the gospel, gets him under the covenants of rebirth, and brings him in here, and that's a preparatory work. You see that? Now, the church presides over that and fulfills that responsibility. So uh, uh, the spirit of Elias is first, and then he goes on, quoting now from the prophet, the teachings, page 340, and the spirit and power of Elijah is to come after, holding the keys of power building the temple, and the word temple now is a symbol now of the holy order, building the temple, i.e., the holy order, to the capstone. Not, tape, not up above and putting the capstone on, but building the temple to the capstone, placing the seals of the Melchizedek priesthood upon the house of Israel, and making all things ready. Then Messiah comes to his temple which is last of all. Now let me analyze that with you just a minute. The spirit of Elias then reaches out, brings people into the family of Christ to become sons and daughters. And then what does the spirit of Elijah do? It takes those people and organizes them into families. And a woman is sealed to her husband, and children are sealed to their parents. And not only that, are they organized, but when they're sanctified, it places the seals of the holy priesthood on them and makes everything ready. You see that? Makes everything ready. And in that sense, then, Elijah does two things. He organizes and he places the seals of the holy priesthood on those sacred family uh, arrangements. Can you see that? He does that. And when he's done this, he builds the temple up to the capstone. Now he doesn't put the capstone on. 
He builds it to the capstone. And then Messiah comes. See, Elijah is in here. This is the work of Elijah. And he also takes and uses this Gentile science of genealogy. I don't mean to be crass in saying it that way, but it is a Gentile science to spare it out family histories and genealogical data, etc., etc., and he uses that to extend those same blessings to past generations. You see that? To tie them in to give them the same blessings because we can't be saved without them. All right? Uh, so Elijah then is here, and he, he brings them in, and then with the church working in connection with that to perfect the saints, to edify, to nurture, to strengthen these children who now become fathers and mothers and who need counsel in the priesthood in their role of fatherhood, how to be a father under Christ in your family, see? And that's what a home teacher ought to do. He ought to minister then in that home and tell those kids how to become sons and daughters and help the father in doing it and then help the parents then to become fathers and mothers spiritually under Christ within that holy order which they have had uh, organized in relation to themselves by the sacred rites and covenants of the temple. Now, we got the idea there, see? All right, then they build that up to the capstone. Now, who puts the capstone on? And the answer is Messiah. The Messiah then puts the capstone on. And while the office of Elias is a missionary work and the spirit then of the preparatory gospel, and Elijah then is the spirit then of the family order and fullness of priesthood blessings, Messiah is he who has all power in heaven and earth. And he comes then to his temple, and this is why he comes to his temple, and it will be the Jackson County Temple. He comes to put the capstone on. Now, what is the capstone? Without speaking too far out of school, let's just reason a little bit. When you begin this sacred program in the house of the Lord, you begin with what I call the initiatory ordinances. I like to take the initiatory assignments and go back there. Some people say, oh, they're just trivial. I like to sit there and meditate on really what's being done and where that is going to end in eternity, the thing that you're doing there in those sacred initiatory ordinances, because you're being washed and anointed to become something, to become kings and priests and the sisters, queens and priestesses. Now, you're not that yet. You've just got the door open to become, okay? And then in order to become that, you've got to have a greater endowment of the Spirit. And with that endowment, see, ordinances aren't just ordinances and aren't nice things to go through as sacred rituals with meaning symbolically. They are all that. But there's life in ordinances. There's living power in ordinances. And the sacred ordinance then of the holy endowment is designed to endow. Endow is to put on. Uh, it used to be that they wrote the old insurance policies of 20 pay life endowment at 65. You paid your premium for 20 years, and at 65 then there was a stipulated uh, amount of money that would be given, the endowment that would be given, see. Now, the, the, the ordinances of the temple then are ordinances of endowment, and the design is to endow a person with power. That's why they send missionaries through the temple. That's why the Lord told the apostles at Jerusalem to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endowed with power, because you don't teach the gospel merely by telling a story. You preach by the power of the Holy Ghost. And the, even with the gift of the Holy Ghost, that power is apparently not as intensely centered in the divine emissary as it can be if he's been through the temple. Because in the temple you receive certain ordinances, and with those ordinances there is a flow of power to that individual. I can remember when I received my temple ordinances years and years ago, more years than I think of. I was 19 years old at the time. I wasn't going on the mission, and I wasn't getting married. I uh, talked to her with my father, and we just felt it might be a good idea, and I followed his counsel, and he said, why don't we go down to the Logan Temple? 
and get your endowment. See, Idaho Falls Temple hadn't been built yet. So we went to the Logan Temple, and I received my endowment. And I can still remember, I can still remember it, that after receiving that, it was like putting on a warm overcoat on a chilly day. The spiritual power that I felt, it was warm, it was radiant. There was a spirit of enlightenment. There was a witness and a testimony that came from spiritual sources and spiritual power. I can still feel that surging through my system today, that spiritual power that comes. See, it's an endowment. Now, we send missionaries through that so that if they're humble and don't just horse around in the mission field, if they're humble and they teach by that power, they will have a greater endowment of the Holy Spirit than otherwise they would have, see? And that's the converging process. But that's a kind of a side issue. The real purpose, not I'm say the real, don't misunderstand me on that. The central purpose is to take a person who has been washed and anointed to become a king and a priest and his wife a queen and a priestess and open up the batteries of divine truth and power. Why? So that they can become fathers and mothers spiritually, see? And then on that basis, on that basis then, they, having gone through the veil into the sacred celestial room, representative of coming into God's presence and on that plane and level of things, then they go and are married for time and eternity. And their lives are established in that marriage covenant on the covenants of the holy endowment. Sometimes as you go through the temple, and it's a good thing uh, to practice once in a while, sit down quietly somewhere in the celestial room with your wife and just ask her and discuss together how can we better establish our lives on the covenants that we've made? Now, can you be a consecrated person? Absolutely. If you don't feel that you are, you are distorted in your thinking. Now, you can't go through the mechanism of consecration and uh, get a stewardship and all that kind of thing, but you can certainly get the posture of it, and we are expected to get the posture of it, and to live on a consecrated plane. See, can you... Uh, uh, live all those other covenants, and should they be the foundation of our homes? You see that? That's what we're talking about. And then when you get to that point then, and they're perfected, then Christ comes to his temple. After, for example, Elijah has done his work, organized it, brought people up to the point where they're sanctified, given them an assurance of eternal life and that kind of thing, then they're ready for Christ to come to his temple. And when he comes to his temple, he comes then and makes those people kings and priests in actual fact and queens and priestesses who have been organized into that holy system and who have been sanctified and who are now worthy to actually be kings and priests and queens and priestesses. And so he comes to his temple and puts on the capstone. The capstone is the last rock. It's the thing that completes the structure. The first rock then is to wash in order to become something. The internal program is to give the means to that end. And the capstone then is putting on the final work and this then is done through the office of Messiah and relates then to all power in heaven and earth and opening up the vista of power and glory to those who receive it. Now this will be done in the great uh, temple at Jackson County, preliminary to Christ's coming to the great council of Adam and Diamond. We'll talk about that a little later, okay? All right, now in that sense then, the law of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of Zion then has its center in the temple. And there then we deal with certain features of divine law. We deal with one basic feature called the, the law of the gospel. Now, the law of the gospel is found pretty well all through the scriptures. But if you were to, to select one major statement, that embodies and capsulizes and uh, gives the law of the gospel, what would that be? 
And the answer is the Sermon on the Mount. That's the answer. When we covenant to obey the law of the gospel, we covenant to obey the Sermon on the Mount, to go the second mile, to love our enemies. We covenant, for example, where Jesus said, it's been said in old times, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whoso looketh upon a woman with lust has committed adultery in his heart. The gospel is not here to change your conduct as the primary purpose of its being. The gospel is here to change your hearts and give you a new soul and make you a new creature, and then your conduct will follow. See, And uh, uh, so the old law of Moses prohibited external acts. Don't uh, hit your enemy too hard. Uh, don't commit adultery. Don't do this and don't do that. The new law dealt with the heart and the transformation of the soul. And you say that's a hard one, and it is a hard one. But note also what the Lord said here as he gave the, the uh, law of the gospel to the Nephites. In 3 Nephi 12, verse 20, Therefore come unto me, and be ye saved. For verily I say unto you that except ye shall keep my commandments, which I have commanded you at this time, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we will not enter into the kingdom of heaven except on the basis of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, some people hold the Sermon on the Mount up as a great ideal, and to the Christian world, basically, that's it. It's an ideal that you look for, but you never quite attain. Now, what the Savior is saying is, buddy, we better attain it. But the fact that he commanded us to be perfect implies that he gave us the wherewithal to do that, does it not? And if you read the third Nephi account of the Sermon on the Mount, you'll find some very unique differences between that and the uh, account given in the book of Matthew. Now, those same differences come out in the inspired revision of Matthew, uh, which Joseph Smith gave by revelation. And uh, they center around a new foundation, not just uh, a statement of principles, but around a given foundation, around what I call a fundamental foundation beatitude. And that basic fundamental or foundation beatitude is given to the Nephites here in 3 Nephi 12, verse 1, and on through to verse 2. And basically, not reading the whole thing, it's simply this. Blessed. Blessed are ye if you give heed unto the words of these twelve, whom I have chosen, uh, and so forth, and uh, that they might baptize you with water. And after that ye are baptized in water, then I will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Therefore, blessed are ye if ye shall believe in me and be baptized after that ye have seen me and know that I am. The fundamental beatitude is what? Blessed are they then who believe and are baptized in water and who get the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. Now he goes on and applies that to others beyond the, the Nephites. He says, and again, more blessed, even more blessed, are they who shall believe in your words, because that ye have te that shall testify that ye have seen me, and that ye know that I am. Yea, blessed are they who shall believe in your words and come down into the depths of humility and... Uh, uh, are baptized, for they shall be visited with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and shall receive a remission of their sins. And then on that basis he gives the rest of the Beatitudes. But the relationship of the two is that here is this fundamental Beatitude relating to the gospel, remission of sins and the power of the Holy Ghost and the baptism of fire, the cleansing by which you have no more disposition to do evil. See. And then these other Beatitudes each take off from that. Note how it's worded. He gives this first one, and then to be in the second, he says, Yea, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, what does the word yea do? It extends this fundamental Beatitude into a specific area, does it not? 
Yea, blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me. And the King James Version doesn't have that one. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then it says, and again. Now, what does the words and again do? It takes the idea back to the initial foundation, does it not? It takes the idea back to the initial foundation and runs it off in another expression of how specifically in detail that fundamental beatitude now is to be expressed in the lives of the saints who have been baptized of water and of the Holy Spirit and the fire of the Lord's glory. See, And he says then, And again, blessed are all they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then it adds in the next one, and, and the word and then extends it again, and blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And, bringing it back now to the fundamental one, and running in another expression, and blessed are all they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, some people don't want to learn much more truth than what they know. They're like skinny calves. They don't know where to get nurture, and essentially they starve and swivel up spiritually. A true Latter-day Saint is one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Now, what does it mean? Go out and fast for three days, and then have someone run you by the local donut shop. <coughs> and see the pull that would drag you on in, or have someone cook a lovely dinner with a nice roast, or someone who's doing his steaks outside the next door, and the wind brings it over to you after you've fasted and, and uh, haven't had anything to drink for three days. And then how do you feel? Now, if you're in that posture in the gospel, then you're in, on target. If you're not in that posture every day, then you're off target. Now, the promise is, if you're in that posture, you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. And what does the Holy Ghost do? It's a revelatory power. It'll reveal things to you as you study the Scriptures in that posture. It'll open the Scriptures. The neon lamps will turn on. And the Lord's Spirit will be with you. And it can even get to the point where whole sentences of explanation, here is how it is, because you are hungering. They tell the story of Socrates, visited by an individual who wanted to know how to become a philosopher. So he took him down to the sea, walked out into the water a ways, grabbed the guy by the nab of the neck and stuffed him under, and held him. He was almost drowned, and dragged him up, laid him on the beach, and walked off. That's a rude lesson, but very effective. The guy finally came to himself and got his breath and finally found Socrates and said, Hey, what did you do that for? He said, Well, you wanted to know how to become a philosopher, didn't you? How did you feel when you were underwater? What would you have given for a breath of air? Wow, it's my life. He says, Now, when you search for knowledge to the same extent that you were grasping for air, you'll become a philosopher. Now, I say to you, you'll be a, same, a saint on the same principle, see? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, I can't go on in this. We're running out of time. But the law of the gospel, then, uh, is very well defined, 3 Nephi chapter 12, 13, and 14, with the end objective of be therefore perfect and uh, founded on the Beatitudes and the correlated Beatitudes, if I can designate between them. And then the law of the gospel versus the law of Moses is talked of. And then he gives a whole section on the outward versus the inner man. See, what is the outward man and what's the inner man? You operate on both planes. All right, now, in the, the order of Zion, it's founded on this. And then it's founded also on what we call the law of consecration. Now, some people have some weird ideas about the law of consecration. Unfortunately, back in 1874, I'm not saying that program is unfortunate, but in 1874, the uh, Brethren instituted what we call the, the, uh, the United Order throughout 
the Western communities of the Latter-day Saints. And every community had one. There was a United Order in Provo, and there was one in Parowan, and there was one in Orderville, and there was one in, uh, in uh, Brigham City, and there was one in Salt Lake City, and all of that, see. The only one we ever think about is the one in Orderville. Now, in that day, in order to cope with the challenges of rugged individualism, this idea of root hog or die, which was so characteristic of the frontier, in order to do that, some of these brethren felt that they had to begin with a system of just total union, including economic union. And so in Orderville, then, everyone consecrated, but no one got a stewardship. And they get up in the morning and report to your bishop or your supervisor, and he would tell you the job to do on the community farm or whatever venture the community was involved in that day. And then the sisters would get organized, and some of them would do the cooking, and some would wash the dishes, and then they had the baby tenders, and it was actually a system of Christian communism. Actually a system of Christian communism. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that's the only idea that is remained out of that effort. Now, the, the Brigham City United Order was the most ideal in the true pattern of the Doctrine and Covenants. And this was presided over and directed by Lorenzo Snow, one of the twelve who later became president of the church. See? And it was a system of stewardships and uh, a system of Christian free enterprise under the covenants of the gospel. See, The one down in Orderville is a system then of Christian communism. And so we get the idea at times that Orderville is the great ideal, and that's not. It's not the law of consecration. It was an effort, an experimental effort. And unfortunately, they named the whole town after it, and it hangs on, see. But uh, so we need to think past that. Now, under the law of consecration, there's some central ideas. The central idea is the word heirship. When a person consecrates, then that person has a right to be an heir. Some people think that consecration leaves you with nothing. I've heard people say, well, hey, if you can't pay your tithing, what are you going to do when you have to consecrate? And the inference they leave with me is that you don't have anything left, maybe even not a fig leaf, see. You just, you just give it all and that's it, see. Now that's not quite the order of things. Note how the prophet Joseph Smith put it. He's uh, talking now about this process of consecrating and so forth, and he says, the matter of consecration must be done by the mutual consent of the bishop and the individual. For to give the bishop power to say how much every man shall have, and he be obliged to comply with the bishop's judgment, is giving to the bishop more power than the king has. And then he goes on to say, and let the individual say how much he had, then, is to make the bishop uh, uh, all things to all people. And that fall program falls on its face. He says, the fact is there must be a balance or equilibrium be, uh, between the, ch the, the bishop and the church. Now, the idea, though, then, is that the person under mutual uh, negotiation and discussion with priesthood authority consecrates himself all that he has, just takes his pocketbook out, lays it on the table, gets his stocks, his bonds, his deeds, etc., and says, here they are, I give them to you. And he does this then as the initial act. But that initial act then has its reciprocal benefits. As the prophet said in this same statement, the fact is this, a man is bound by the law of the church to consecrate to the bishop before he can be considered a legal heir to the kingdom of Zion. Now what does it mean to be an heir? What is an heir? Wilford Rudolf was one in Missouri who consecrated. And he wrote in his journal, the old handwritten journal from which I copied this, Be it known that I, Wilford Woodruff, freely covenant with my God, that I freely consecrate and dedicate myself together with all my properties and effects unto the Lord for the purpose of assisting in building up his kingdom, even Zion, on the earth. Note this, that I may keep his law and lay all things before the bishop of his church, that I may be a lawful heir in the kingdom of God, even the celestial kingdom. And then having reported the covenant he made, 
he made this explanation. Believing it, he said, to be the duty of Latter-day Saints to consecrate and dedicate all their properties with themselves unto God in order to become a lawful heir. It was under such a view of the subject that I consecrated, see. All right, now, an heir is one who owns jointly, something jointly. How would you like to be a joint heir with a multimillionaire? What would you give to become part of that program? Oh, I would, I would just give my everything I've got, my paltry holdings on the mortgage row and all of that, you know. Uh, I'd give all of that. And my commitment of time and devotion, if I were interested economically, in order to have my name on the same checkbook as a multimillionaire and have the right to draw funds from that mutual fund as much as he had it. Now, have I lost anything by consecration? <laughs> Not very much. What do, you, what do you lose? You turn what you have to Christ, and it's his in first place anyway, and then you get the rights of heirship. The rights of heirship entitle you to all that the Lord has, everything within the Father's kingdom. Now that is applied economically, so that as you consecrate, then you have the rights of heirship over that which Christ has. And it's in this sense that we have all things in common. Change the name of the word common to Christ. We have all things in Christ. We have then everything centered in him, and we have a mutual right with others, an equal right with others, to that common fund. And that's what it means to have all things in common. It doesn't mean Christian communism. All right, now as an heir, you have three major rights. Number one, you have the right of stewardship. You have the right then, having consecrated, to go to the bishop and say, okay, I'm here to take care of the next step. And that next step then is to sit down with you and mutually negotiate with you as to the kind and size and nature of my stewardship. And if we can't get along together and make a mutual decision, I don't have to bow the knee and say, hey, I'm just here with my hand out. And you don't have to bow the knee to me and say, here, I just capitulate to your interests. Rather, instead, then, as the prophet instructed, the matter is to be taken up by a council of twelve high priests, and this was before the high council was organized. Presumably, it would be that body. And in that council, six, then, would represent the interest of the individual and six, the interest of the church, and that would be the final arbitrary body, you see. But you have the right of stewardship. And then, as the Lord says in section 42, you have the right to stand in your stewardship. Now, to stand in your stewardship means that you're secure in it, that you direct it, that you are the free manager of it. And in that sense, then, you stand in that. All right, now, the program, then, is that, that you take that stewardship and you manage it. And if it's a farm, then you grow the crops. If it's a manufacturing institution, then you get things busy and turn out the shoes or the clothing or whatever it is. Now, once you get it turned out or manufactured or grown and produced, what do you do with it? Some people say, well, we all turned it into the storehouse. No, you sell it on the open market. The Lord tells us, for example, in section 42, as he deals with this subject and applies it to, to us in, in the economic order. He says, uh, uh, Thou shalt not take thy brother's garment. Verse 54, Thou shalt pay for that which thou shalt receive of thy brother. And so there's a monetary system, and there's a free market, and there's competition. Not cutthroat competition, but if you can make a better mousetrap, boy, you can sell it better. And that benefit of consecration comes in, not of com but a, con a competition comes in where there's a continual upgrading of quality by and through uh, the principle of supply and demand and by and through the competitive program, you see. And then when you've done that and you sold your goods on the open market, 
then you're obligated to take a look at your family as you would take a look at another man's family. The Lord tells us there must be a standard of equality. And that implies then maybe setting up a system of criteria. If you've got five children, then you ought to keep more from the profits of your stewardship than someone who's got only two children in order to live on the same standard of living. See, And if you've got some special needs in the way of educating your children, he's going to go son to medical school and all that, then you, there's an additional basis to, to say, I need to keep more out of the operation of my stewardship. But you go to the bishop and have an accounting. And at the end of the year, you say, here's what my stewardship produced, and here legitimately is what I feel I could keep them from my family in order to have an equal standard with other people. And then you turn the rest of the stuff into the storehouse. Now, what happens to it when it's turned into the storehouse? It's not pouring it down a rat hole. It's not lost. It's turned into the storehouse. Now, it's used then for new uh, stewardships for people who are who are growing up, your kids are growing up, they, they need to have some basis for business, an opportunity economically. And it's also used, keep in mind now that you're an heir, it's also used as an operational fund on which you can draw to operate your business the next year. Now note how the Lord puts it here in, in section 82. There's two places here, section 82 and section 104. Uh, where the Lord deals with that. And he says, for example, verse 17, uh, you are to be equal, or in other words, you are to have equal claims on the properties that is in the storehouse for the benefit of managing the concerns of your stewardship. Every man, according to his wants and needs, inasmuch as his wants and needs. 180, 104, beginning with verse uh, 58, it says this that you receive in your stewardships by improving upon the properties which I have appointed in you in houses or lands or so forth shall be cast into the storehouse. So you turned it in. When do you turn money to the storehouse? Well, when does a business bank? If you're in a business program, when do you bank your money? Well, you do it daily, see. Now, when you turned it in, he says, or in other words, if any man among you obtain five dollars, you let him cast it into the treasury, or ten, or twenty, or fifty, or a hundred. And then verse 70, and let not any among you say that it is his own. When you put it in there, it's not your personal bank account. You do keep an account of it, but when you turn it in there, you turn it in as a new consecration. The system of consecration is not a one-time thing. You turn it in as a new consecration. And let not any among you say that it is his own, for it shall not be called his or any part of it. And there shall not any part of it be used or taken out of the treasury only by the voice and common consent of the order. Now, you can take it out, and it's by the voice and common consent, and the voice and common consent then, as he explains it here, is functional in this way. He says, and this then is the voice and common consent, verse 72, that any man among you say to the treasurer, I have need of this to help me in my stewardship. You don't go to the treasurer and get money to buy your, your wife a new, a new bonnet. That money that you use there is for your business. You are an heir. You have an equal right to draw on it, to operate, and to expand your business. And there better be a good uh, on-the-ball treasurer there, just like a bank official who doesn't just hand out money if you want to come in for a loan, see, who takes a look at it and who might say something, well, we better take a look at this and turn this to the council of the order and get some wisdom on it, see, before you... Otherwise, you just got to have one or two guys, and they'll draw everything out and, and squander it, see. But uh, he says, this is the order then, that any man say, I have needed this to help me in my stewardship as an operating fund. He said, if it be five dollars, or ten, or twenty, or fifty, or a hundred, the treasurer shall give unto him the sum which is required of him, maybe until he is found a transgressor, and it is manifest before the council of the order plainly that it is an unfaithful and unwise steward. But so long as he's in full stewardship or full fellowship and is faithful and wise in his stewardship, this shall be his token unto the treasure, the treasures will not withhold. And then it adds this qualifying note. But in trace case of transgression, the treasurer, not just the person, but the treasurer, shall be subject to the counsel and voice of the order. Now, why make the treasurer responsible? Well, because he's the guy that's handing out the money. You see that? All right, now. Under the law of consecration, you just take everything and you consecrate it. That introduces you to become an heir. An heir is one who jointly owns. 
As an heir, you have the right, number one, to a stewardship. And you can negotiate for the size and kind of stewardship. Number two, since you're going to turn your surplus produce in over and above what is required for you to live on an equal standard with others, then you turn that surplus in, and that's used now, among other things, as an operating fund to operate and expand your business. And you have a legal right to draw upon it as well as anyone else. Now, what does that do for opening the door of opportunity for someone who is really solid and stable but wants to move? It gives him the wherewithal to do so, does it not? See? It gives him that. And then thirdly, you have the right of voice and of vote in the use of those community funds. Maybe you need a little extension, for example, on some community uh, venture. You need the playgrounds to be uh, uh, remodeled and expanded, and where do you get the money? You need the chapel to have some little expansion. Where do you get the money? It comes from the storehouse. Do they just arbitrarily take it? No. They say, hey, we're going to have a meeting concerning the United Order now. And you go there and you, you say, all right, I want to see where this money's going. And you have the right of voice and the vote in the storehouse. How can you live the law of consecration stewardship? We get the idea that it's some kind of an oddball, ethereal, non-reasonable, impractical thing that can never be really applied. When the Nephites applied it, and we have two or three examples. I don't have time to read with them to you, but read Mosiah 18 and Alma 1, and then read through 4th Nephi. Now let me just turn to Alma chapter 1 here for a minute to show some of the fruits of this Christian system of free enterprise. Now it's not root hog and diism, it's not cutthroat competition, but it is free enterprise. And it's founded on a Christian principle where each person covenants with Christ and is centered in Christ. And under this kind of a program, then you have the opening up of the floodgates of economic benefit and economic blessing. And here's how it happened with the Nephites. It says, and they did establish the affairs of the church, and thus they began to have continual peace. This is verse 28 of Alma 1. And now, because of the steadiness of the church, they began to be exceeding rich, having abundance of all things whatsoever they stood in need, and abundance of flocks and herds and fatlings and every kind, uh, and also an abundance of grain and of gold and of silver and of precious things, and an abundance of silk and fine twined linen and all manner of good and homely cloth. And thus, in their prosperous circumstances, they who were naked and so forth. And then in verse 31, and thus they did prosper and become far more wealthy. Now that economic program was so dynamic that even though Christ had made a personal appearance among the, the Nephites and given the manifestations of the Spirit and power and great glory, and you had three Nephites running around living year after year, never subject to death in the midst of these people, that economic program was so dynamic in its productivity that they became so wealthy, and then they put their eyes on the things of the world. And when they did, then they went into apostasy. See? Now you compare that with what the Russians have been trying to do for the last years, and they're finally falling flat on their face and realizing they don't, they don't have the means then to run and operate a collective system. See? Now the law of consecration is not collectivism. It's not the welfare state. People say, well, Brother Anders, the law of consecration, socialism. I say, no. Is it capitalism? No. And then they begin to puzzle and question and say, what is it? I say it's united orderism. <clears throat> That's what it is. It's a critter that looks all alone by itself. Now, just one fast word. I've got to hurry here. <clears throat> The design, then, is to build Zion to be an enzyme. An enzyme is something to which you look. And Zion is supposed to become an enzyme and a standard on the Lord's program. Now, that's not as a collective system, but that is as a group of Latter-day Saints united by the powers of the Spirit, working together in the construction crew of the Church to build things up and to strengthen each other, and then to implement this order of things which is designed to make them independent, individually and together as a body, above every other system beneath the celestial world. 
The Prophet Joseph Smith, when he went down to Jackson County and established or laid the foundations for Zion, came back home and wrote in his journal, it was my endeavor to so organize the brethren that uh, they might become independent above every other celestial world on the basis of bonds of mutual covenant and mutual friendship. Now that's the idea, see, on the bonds of mutual friend covenant and mutual friendship. And be a free, united people in Christ and have freedom economically but on a consecrated basis. Love your neighbor economically as yourself. Establish an order of things centering in the storehouse that gives him as much right to draw on that storehouse to operate and expand his stewardship as you have so that, so that where there is dynamic, ingenious inventiveness in people and the need for money to utilize that is there, and where there's an equality of opportunity and where there are consumers and producers and you develop then, instead of having a society of leeches and of uh, people who are living on people like we now have, and you wonder who does the final and the ultimate work to start with, instead of that then, you have the forces of economic enterprise opened up and the union of economic cooperatives established and the powers of regenerated people living in Christ, committed to Christ, and the end result is that they look back at us and think that we're in the dark ages economically. They will, believe me, when we finally get on the stick and do it. Now that becomes an enzyme and a means to an end. The, the end then is to establish Zion and with this now then to teach people the right way of not only social life and righteousness in the gospel, but to teach them the true economics of life and then to teach them also how to establish justice and civil rights. And so the design of Zion then is to do all of these and on the basis of this usher in a millennial order. Here in section 78 of the Doctrine and Covenants verse 13, the Lord speaks of this in a classic statement and he indicates the reasons for it. He says, but it's uh, he says, Behold, this is the preparation whereof I prepare you, and the foundation and the ensample which I give unto you, whereby you may accomplish the commandments which are given you, that through my providence, note this, notwithstanding the tribulation which shall descend upon you, that the church may stand independent above all other creatures beneath the celestial world. Now the sentence doesn't end there. Note what it goes on. That you may come up unto the crown prepared for you and be made rulers over many kingdoms, saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Zion. Now when we show people the solution to economic problems, when we show them the solution to spiritual problems and to the righteous life that Christianity actually designed, and they come to us, then we can also show them how to establish a political order and when we save the Constitution, the elders do, it'll be on this basis. And the end result will be that you'll have Zion as an enzyme independent of all other systems within the celestial world. It'll take care of economic equality. And then centered in there, not in the church, we're going to the holy order on this one, not in the church, not the president of the church, but centered in the holy order, which is an order of kings and of priests just like Mosiah, just like Benjamin. Then a law of, of political truth and justice, just like the Nephites had, the standard of liberty and all of that, see? All that is talked about in Mosiah 29 on the political order. Then that is extended and political law, separate from the church, not making it a collectivized thing like we've done where the economics and the politics are tied together, but on the original foundation that the fathers of this nation intended, the total and complete separation of church and state and the total and complete separation of economics and state. Now we do a lot of talking about the first, and we want to even separate religion from state. But the design is then you separate the two organizations, and then you separate economics. And what are the, how do the saints take care of their economics? Through covenant through Zion, through consecration, right? 
Do they have to go to the, to the government then for support economically? Uh-uh. So the political program can flow in its own channel. And the political organization can be simply that, a political organization. Concerned with what? Maintaining the rights of the people. Taking care of those necessarily political processes that relate to interstate and intrastate commerce and that kind of thing. And the coinage of money. And those things, which are strictly political. And raise then the standard of Zion and then put the political program there and extend this order of things throughout the world. And do it then on a theo-democratic basis, which is more completely appropriate to the original intent than the two-party system. The Founding Fathers never intended to establish political parties. Washington gets up in his final address and says, let me warn you in the, most small in the solemn manner of the baneful influence of parties. They never intended to until you finally get to about 1828 when Jackson brings in the program and from there on then we depart from the Founding Fathers and we've got party politics running right. But they didn't have any party politics intended in the original idea. Now you take Zion up there and you take the Holy Order and you take that original concept and you put the power of nomination in, the, in that body and then the confirm of consent and so forth into people uh, in relation to officers appointed and called in that process. And then you extend that program throughout the world, as Joseph Smith would do when he'd say, come Mexico, come Canada, and come all the world, and let's get under the Constitution, see? Now, I wouldn't vote for a two-party system of world government that's a free government, and neither would you, because it would put the preponderance of power where? Among the uneducated masses of the earth, subject to the mount banks of the day and the, and the, the soapbox, and that kind of thing. And it would take away the basic rights, ultimately. But I would vote for a system where you had an enzyme of truth standing up there teaching people how to live righteously and how to solve their problems economically and how to have economic equality and how to have brotherhood and union. And then have that system stand as an enzyme showing the way to the solution to problems. And then in that system, under Christ, a political order that is simply limited to the operations of the political state and extend that program throughout the earth. Now that, brothers and sisters, is the ideal of Zion. When the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem to become a universal program, it will do so on the basis that we as Latter-day Saints have sanctified our lives and raised the standard of Zion. I spent some time back in 1968 traveling in the Middle East about a couple of months through there, and I saw the squalid poverty and I saw little kids who had flies crawling over their face with maggots crawling out of their eyes and just in squalid poverty and so forth, and my heart just yearned for those people. They didn't have an economic pro a, a political program that allowed them to really, I mean, there was no truth and there was no real stability politically. And I went home and I vowed after that that I was going to do all I could do to help the Latter-day Saints see that if they want a solution to those problems over there, they've got to raise an enzyme. Granted, raise your family, prepare their mission, but after that we're just all dressed up with nowhere to go. The enzyme has got to be raised. You don't have to convert all the world before you raise the enzyme and establish the millennial kingdom. We won't convert even a fraction hardly of the earth before the, the kingdom becomes universal. You will raise the enzyme and people will come to it and they'll sustain it. And you'll extend political liberty and freedom and show them the way through teaching the correct view. Now instead of doing that as Latter-day Saints here in the West, we have joined Babylon. We have joined Babylon, we're trying to outcompete Babylon on her terms rather than become an independent people under Christ. We're trying to do that. And the Lord is furious about that, I believe, my personal view. He is more concerned about the lackadaisical situations that exist among the Latter-day Saints who are walking in darkness at noonday than he is about the crud and the corruption that's going on in the Gentile society. And he's going to clean Zion and raise Zion as an ensign. And may the Lord bless us to see that, brothers and sisters, and to accomplish that I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.